Well, before we start, I'd like to show you a video which you may have seen before. I posted it um, actually this week on social media, and I hope you enjoy this video. A doctor walks in with bad news and good. The bad news? You have a fatal disease. The good news? There is a cure. A treatment that is 100% effective. All you have to do is accept it. What would you choose? Every day, millions of people say no to the cure. They choose to live with the disease, or they choose to believe it doesn't exist. And the symptoms are everywhere. Depression, broken families, greed, selfishness, corruption, escalating violence and hate toward one another, murder, terrorism, abuse. What is this condition that affects us all? What is this sickness or disease we cannot shake? It's called sin, and we're all born with it. We do what we want to do. We do what's best for us. We do what feels good. It comes naturally to all of us, and it stains us. It opens up a great divide between us and our Creator, because it's not how we were created to live. We were designed by God for more, to be part of something bigger than just these temporary lives, to know our Creator as Father, to follow Him, and to live for Him. More than anything, He desires a personal, one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. But it's impossible. Our sin and His perfection are incompatible. We may try to have our good deeds outweigh our bad, but they can never get us closer to a perfect God. That is why Jesus came to us. God sent His Son not as a king or a mighty warrior, but as a baby, born in a stable, born to die on the cross for our sins, to pay for our mistakes, our sins with His perfect blood. With His death, He bridged the great divide. The punishment that we deserve, He took upon Himself. With His resurrection, He conquered the grave. He made a way for us when there seemed to be no way. So how do we respond? Please make this your prayer. Say, God, I am a sinner, imperfect, messed up, going my own way. I trust today in the blood of Jesus to wash all my sins away. And I invite you into my life. I give you control. And I ask for your Holy Spirit to come and live inside of me. If you will say these words and mean it with all your heart, you will become a Christian today, right now, right where you are, and God will hear you. The cure is before you and your family. What will you do? I hope you liked that presentation. It's one of many um, ways of presenting the gospel, and I think it's quite nice. And I, I, what thrills me is that it highlights the need for faith in Christ, to believe without seeing. It requires repentance, to say sorry for our sin, um, which many gospel presentations seem to omit. And also, um, I think what maybe was maybe a little bit missing in the presentation is also the, the need to surrender to Jesus, because it's not just we give our life to Christ and that's it all finished. We can go home. We need to surrender our lives to Jesus every day in service. We need to follow him. We need to roll up our sleeves and get involved in his work. Um, over the months, we've um, we've we've looked at a lot of topics, haven't we? Um, and what I want to do is I want to just give you maybe just a few reminders. You've got an opportunity to also please ask away. Please challenge some of these points. If maybe you hear them, it sounds right or maybe it doesn't sound right. I'd like you to feel free to actually ask the question. You know, well, Tony, you know, is that really the case? You know, where does it say in the Bible that um, how do we know that to be true? Um now, we also looked at um, also different religious groups as well. We looked at Islam. We've looked at uh, Japanese beliefs as well. But let us go to some of that core teaching. I'm just going to show you the slides um, to remind you. 
some of the core points I would love you please to remember. Um, remember that evangelism, it is the supreme priority of the church. In the church, in your ministries, in your own personal projects, there are so many things we end up doing. Um, sometimes I, I think we maybe spend more time on admin and worship and, and announcements than we actually do on keeping the main thing the main thing. And remember, evangelism comes from the Greek word euangelion. And it uh, it translates as the proclamation of the gospel. It's the proclamation of the gospel and nothing else. Um, This is a a priority. Why is it a priority? Well, again, if you remember, I gave you the illustration. Imagine you're in a hospital and you're praying for a sick person. Now, this sick person is so ill, you've discovered they've got very short time to live. They're going to die. You've also discovered that they're not a Christian. So that means you should know that that right now, this person, if they're not a believer, they're about to die, then it sounds, according to the Bible, like they're going to go to hell. And they're not just going to go to hell for a short visit. It's going to be a visit to hell for eternity. Because that's what the Bible says. So I wonder what you're going to do with your short time with this, this person. Are you going to sing them a song? Well, that's nice. <laughs> Are you going to pray for them? Well, that's biblical. Are you going to read a portion of scripture? Maybe Psalm 23? Well, that's cozy. Uh, are you going to hold their hand and show them love with your eyes and your hands and your words? Well, that's lovely. But I don't know about you, but for me, I'm going to proclaim the gospel. Why? Because Tony thinks it's a good idea? No. What I think is irrelevant. What matters is what the Lord Jesus Christ has commanded us to do. Um, You know, are you with me, friends? The Lord has commanded us to proclaim the gospel. Uh, And and so why am I going to share the gospel? Well, yes, Jesus has commanded us to do that. Um, But also because of the compassion um, that I I feel now, you know, I, I don't want that person to go to hell. I feel compassion. And so I need to tell them the gospel. If they've never heard it, how are they going to believe in it? Uh, Are you with me? And so so it becomes a priority. Just very quickly, Max, can you see the screen? Yes, I can, Tony, but some people can't. And I'm just asking uh, who who can't see the screen. Well, that's unavoidable if somebody can't. So as long as you can. All right, then we'll continue. Um, And so please remember some of the key terms. You know, evangelism, it's the proclamation of the gospel. Why do we come up with that definition? Well, it's because that's what the the original words euangelion translates as, the proclamation of the gospel. And we can understand the proclamation to be both the, the spoken and the written word, which you can speak it and you can spread it. So, for example, you can spread the gospel using literature. And again, people sometimes question that and they think, but is that really evangelism? Well, yes, it is. Just imagine if you are mute. There are some people in the world, they can't speak. Well, does it mean they can't evangelize? No, of course they can evangelize. They can use literature. What about people that are deaf? What, the gospel's not for them? <laughs> well, they can hear the gospel, um, you know, uh, by, by reading it or by using sign language. Uh, are you with me? And so there, there are actually many ways of communicating the message. Please remember that the evangelist is the person who's got the gift to, to, uh, of evangelism. Now, if you remember from the teaching, we agreed that this person should be sharing the gospel regularly. Because if, if you're not sharing the gospel regularly to, to non-believers, to strangers, then you will have no authority. You'll have no experience to train other people. You can't... Ask people to do what you're not even doing yourself. So make sure that you are actually evangelizing on a regular basis. And that will automatically give you those experiences and 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 that authority to teach. And you don't have to be some orator. You know, it's amazing. You can you can teach people by making reports, videos, newsletters, do Facebook posts. 
Every day is an opportunity to encourage and challenge people of how you can sh- share the gospel. Maybe you can share how, how, how you shouldn't be sharing the gospel. Maybe talk about the times when you fail. Sometimes that can in- encourage people more than all of your big successes. Remember that the evangel, well, that's the gospel message that we're all to share. We don't use the word evangel very often, but remember, there is a specific message that we're to share. Yes, you could say that the whole Bible is the gospel. The whole Bible is the good news. Yeah. But if I opened up the Bible and I I, I read to you, uh, for example, um, there we are. Uh, do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. <laughs> I just open up randomly. I've ended up at Leviticus 19 verse uh, 13. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the word of God, but that's not the gospel. The gospel message is a carefully crafted salvation message within the Bible. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. And remember, you may not be an evangelist. Don't worry. Isn't it great that we're not all evangelists? You know, in Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about the fivefold ministry gifts given to the church. You remember, it says it was he who gave sons to be apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers and evangelists. And, you know, there's such a, a, a spectrum of gifts out there in this group here today from people from different countries and nationalities and language groups. How beautiful the, the variety of giftings, some of the gifted to with hospitality, with prayer, with worship to evangelize we may not all be evangelists but we can all be evangelizers anyone who spreads or proclaims the gospel is an evangelizer are you with me um what else did we also study we also um looked at the fact uh, of three wrong definitions now why am i reminding you this stuff today it's so important i have gone to conferences in different places around the world and I've done teaching sessions that last one week, two weeks, uh, very long teaching sessions all day long, every day. And everybody, they all agree. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. They all go away with their notes and they, they've gone away. And then I, I've gone back. I think that in one place it was six months later, in, in other places one year later. And I just do a quick check. OK, what is evangelism? And you start getting these wrong definitions. I'm thinking, what happened? You know, we studied this. We learnt it. And all of a sudden, what, we've forgotten it so easily? And it's amazing. You will be continually bombarded by Satan day by day by day. In fact, before this hour is over, you're going to be attacked by Satan in some spiritual unseen way. Where he's going to try to block you, you from seeing or hearing this material. So please listen with open ears. Remember, there are some wrong definitions. We've agreed that evangelism is correctly translated as the proclamation of the gospel. Satan wants you to believe that evangelism is winning souls. I wonder, since the last time we studied this topic, how many people in this group have referred to winning souls? And, you know, we're doing evangelism because we're going to win souls. You know, we are actually... Yeah, it sounds right, but it's not biblical. Evangelism is not winning souls. Winning souls may be an end result of evangelism. Remember, evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel. It's like sowing seeds. When you sow the seed, that's evangelism. Whether the seed grows or not, well, that's a salvation issue. You know, um, and of course, by the way, a seed may grow, but it may, it may not be harvested. <laughs> so, you know. We'll look more at that in a minute. It's not winning souls. It's the proclamation of the gospel. Um, And why is it not winning souls? Because if you believe evangelism is winning souls, then you're going to stop doing evangelism because of five reasons. You're going to feel failure when you can't win a soul. When you go out sharing the gospel and the person listening is not saved. Well, you're going to feel like a failure. You might fall to the trap of getting a bit pushy with people. You're noticing that when you share the gospel, people are not turning to Christ. They're not saying the prayer of salvation. You're beginning to feel like a failure in evangelism. So what do you do? You might fall to the trap of being a bit more pushy now. A bit more like a salesman. You're going to almost almost bully them with your slick um, examples and and stories. You're you're pushing them now. 
Come on, would you like to say the quick prayer with me? Let's say the prayer. Come to church. <laughs> and, you know, we become bullies. And that's not evangelism. Remember, evangelism is not, is not sales. <laughs> sales is a good job. But uh, evangelism is a free gift. We're not selling anything when we're evangelizing. It's free of charge. Amen. And also, when we share the gospel and we're not seeing souls saved, we're not seeing souls won. Well, another temptation is we water down the message. Um, I enjoy drinking orange squash <laughs> um, and I put in about this much orange. I, I got a very sweet tooth and uh, I like my orange squash to be sweet. If I add twice as much water, this will be not very sweet. If I keep on putting more, more water, more water, more water, eventually it'll only taste of water. Don't do that to the gospel. We do that to the gospel when we stop talking about hell. We stop talking about sin. We stop talking about repentance. And please remember, my friends, you know, the gospel has never been easy. It's, a, it's an unpleasant message that, well, it led to the crucifixion of our, our chief executive officer, Jesus Christ. He was crucified. He had to die on the cross at Calvary. You look at all of the, the, the apostles. They were all slaughtered. Because they were sharing the gospel. So you might find it difficult and embarrassing. Okay, I get it. I doubt it very much in this day and age in most Western countries. You're not going to be crucified for sharing the gospel. Although some of our friends in Pakistan that are with us today. Well, please be careful because you are living in a dangerous situation. But I've got to say to you friends. Stop watering down the gospel. Let us start preaching the historical biblical Christ as Saviour and Lord. Remember, if you think winning the soul, uh, evangelism is winning souls, then you're also going to end up with fruitless results. And also, with that wrong definition, you're going to rule out good methods of evangelism because you did not see immediate fruit, okay? So remember these points. They're very good to remember. It is not winning souls. What is it? Evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel. Please say it together now. Evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel. Again, evangelism, it is the proclamation of the gospel. Of the gospel. Say it over and over again. Remind evangelism yourself. is the proclamation of the gospel. You got it. Okay. A second point. Satan wants you to believe that evangelism is any activity. Any activity that brings a non-Christian closer to the point of conversion. <laughs> My goodness, what a nasty trick. You know, Satan wants you to believe that any activity that Christians do is evangelism, but it's not. If you remember, I gave you the, the, the model of, of sowing seeds to reap a harvest. So what do you do? You first plow the ground. You then sow the seed. You then water the seed to make conditions favorable for the seed to grow. And then the seed grows. Then you harvest what's grown. And then you do threshing. Threshing is where you are refining and cleaning what you've harvested. So remember, plowing the ground, that's when we're softening people's hearts. This is a task focused by the gifts of apostleship, teaching, pastoring, prophecy, and so on. The only step in this model that is evangelism is step two, sowing. When you sow the seed, whether you're spreading the word or proclaiming the word, you are sowing the seed of the gospel. That's evangelism, okay? But also when you sow the seed, that's closely connected to harvesting as well. So the gift of harvesting will focus on sowing and harvesting. Now, um, please remember, um, growing, only God does the growing, okay? That's a supernatural work of the Father and the Holy Spirit to save a soul. So this model should help you to remember what the gifts will mainly focus on. The gifts of apostleship, teaching, pastoring and prophecy, they will focus on softening the hearts of people, watering the seed that's been sown by the evangelizer, and then discipleship, which is the threshing process. And also remember, we did look at a third wrong definition. Satan wants you to believe that evangelism, it is a process. Well, that's a lot of rubbish. Evangelism is not a process. Again, remember, if you've got a seed, you don't, um, 
you know, uh, plant your seed partly into the ground and go away and have a cup of coffee and go back to plant this, push the seed in a little bit more and go away to have your dinner and then go back to push the seed all the way. No, you either you sow the seed or you don't sow the seed. You're either, in other words, you're either sharing the gospel or you're not. You may not always have the opportunity to share the gospel. That, that's OK. The issue here, don't call evangelism a process because you either share the gospel, you either tell somebody or you don't tell them. Are you with me? And if you've only partly told them, well, you haven't told them the gospel yet. You know, don't count your chickens until, <laughs> until your eggs have hatched. Are you with me? Um, and so remember, evangelism is an event within the process. And that's why I think this image here is useful. If you see sowing, that is an event that happens within a whole process of actually trying to grow something and harvest it. Are you with me? Also, if you remember, we looked at three forms of persuasion. Um, and I'm going to end with this before I give you a little story, which I wanted to leave you with today. If you remember, we looked at um, the art of rhetoric by Aristotle and we looked at uh, ethos, logos and pathos. Ethos being the ethics and the credibility um, that we live with. Logos is the word and the reason that we speak with. And pathos is the, actually the emotions and the feeling that we have as well. And I think if you can use all three of these, these forms of persuasion in your evangelism, well, my goodness, it'll only help you to become even more effective um, as you try to share the gospel. Very quickly, I just want to um, share with you a, a testimony that for me is one of the most encouraging testimonies that I can possibly share with you. It is not my testimony, although I can tell you that I met somebody who was led to Christ by the person I'm going to talk about today. Some of you, you would have heard me share this story before uh, and you'll be very pleased to hear it again. Um, but I want to talk to you about a person called Frank Jenner. Frank Jenner of George Street. And a number of years ago in a Baptist church in Crystal Palace in southern London, the Sunday morning service was closing and a stranger stood up at the back of the church and he raised his hand and he said, excuse me, pastor, please, can I share a little testimony? Well, the pastor looked at his watch. This was a little bit unusual. He wasn't sure who this guy was and what he was going to say. Anyway, he said, uh, OK, you've got three minutes. And the man proceeded. He said, I've just moved to this area of London and I used to live in another part of London. And I came from Sydney in Australia. And um, uh, I was actually, you know, I've only been back a short while visiting some relatives. Um, when I was in Sydney, I was walking down George Street. Uh, you know where George Street is it, uh, in Sydney. It runs from the business hub, a very business, busy area, all the way through to the rocks in the colonial area. And a stranger, uh, a, sh a small white haired man, stepped out of a shop, uh, a sh a shop doorway. He put a, a pamphlet in my hands. And uh, he says to me, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, you're going to go to heaven or hell. Well, I was astounded by those words. Nobody has ever you know, asked me that question or given me a, a pamphlet like this. I thanked him courteously and all the way on British Airways um, back to Heathrow in London. I was puzzled by this man and this booklet. I called a friend of mine who lives in this new area where I'm now living. And thank God he's a Christian. He led me to Christ. And my friends, I'm telling you this morning, I'm a Christian. And I want to fellowship at your church. Now, Baptists, they love testimonies like this. Most Christians do. And they all welcomed him and applauded him into the fellowship that morning. Now, that Baptist pastor of that church, he flew to Adelaide in Australia the next week. Only 10 days later, and he was in the middle of a three day teaching series um, in, in a Baptist church in Adelaide. And a woman came to him for counselling and he, he wanted to establish where she stood with Christ. And she said to the pastor, well, I used to live in Sydney. And just a couple of months back, I was visiting friends in Sydney. I was doing some last minute shopping down George Street. 
um, and a, a strange little white-haired man, an elderly man, he stepped out of a shop door and he offered me a pamphlet. He said, excuse me, madam, are you saved? Uh, if you die tonight, are you going to be going to heaven? I was really disturbed by this question. But when I went back to Adelaide, I knew this church was on the next block from, from me. And I went to the pastor. And the pastor in the conversation, he led me to Christ. And I'm telling you that I'm a Christian. Now, this pastor from London is very puzzled. Because two times within two weeks, he's heard the same testimony. This guy in London, this woman in Australia. He then flew to preach at the Mount Pleasant Baptist Church in Perth. And when he was uh, teaching, when his teaching was over, the senior elder of that church took him out for lunch. And he asked him the question, you know, how'd you get saved, mate? And he said, well, I grew up in the church from the age of 15 through Boys Brigade. I never made a commitment to Jesus. I just jumped on the, on the bandwagon like most other people in the church. And because of my business ability, I grew to a place of influence in the church. And one day I was on a business meeting in Sydney just three years ago. And an obnoxious, spiteful little man stepped outside of a shop doorway. And he offered me this religious pamphlet, you know, real rubbish, cheap junk. And he accosted me with the question, uh, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to go to heaven? I tried to tell him I'm a Baptist elder, but he wouldn't listen to me. I was seething with anger all the way home as I was flying on Qantas back to Perth. And I told my pastor, thinking that he would show me some sympathy. But my pastor agreed. He said that he had been disturbed for years, knowing that I did not have a relationship with Jesus. And he was right. I didn't. And my pastor, he led me to Jesus only three years ago. Now, <laughs> this London preacher now is the third time he's heard this testimony. Uh, and when he went back to the UK, he was determined to tell people about this, this testimony. And he was speaking at the Keswick Convention in the Lake District in the north of England. And he shared the three testimonies. And at the close of his teaching session, four elderly pastors, they came to him and they said, Pastor, we got saved between 25 and 35 years ago, respectively, through that little man that you describe on George Street in Sydney giving us a booklet, a tract, and asking the same question. He then flew, the pastor from London, he then flew um, the next week to preach at a similar convention in the Caribbean to missionaries. And he shared the testimonies. And at the close of the teaching session, three missionaries, three missionaries, they came up to him and they said, we got saved between 15 and 25 years ago, respectively, through this man you are describing with the same testimony on George Street, giving us a booklet in Sydney. Coming back to London, he first, on his journey back, he stopped outside Atlanta, Georgia. He was speaking at a naval chaplain's convention. And um, when his three days of teaching the chaplains came to an end, the chaplain general, um, who was responsible for over 1,000 chaplains in Albany, he took him out for a meal. And he asked this chaplain general, how did you become a Christian? And the chaplain general in, in Albany, he said, well, it was miraculous. I was serving on a United States battleship. And I lived a reprobate life. I was drinking so much alcohol and doing many things very bad. And we were doing exercises in the South Pacific. And we docked in Sydney Harbour for replenishments. We hit King's Cross with a vengeance. I got blind drunk. I got on the wrong bus and I got off at George Street. And as I got off the bus, I thought I was looking at a ghost. There was this elderly white-haired man. He jumped in front of me, 
and he pushed the pamphlet in my hand. He said, sailor, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to go to heaven? The fear of God, it hit me immediately. I was shocked sober and I ran back to the battleship and I went to find the chaplain of the ship. And the chaplain led me to Christ. And I soon began to prepare for the ministry under his guidance. And here I am. I'm in charge of over 1,000 chaplains. And we're bent on winning Albany for Christ. Well, this London preacher, six months later, he flew to a convention for 5,000 missionaries in India. It was a remote corner of northeastern India. And at the end... The Indian missionary in charge, a humble little man, took him to his home for a humble meal, a very basic food. And he said to him, sir, how did you as a Hindu come to Christ? And he said, well, I was in a very privileged position because I worked for the Indian diplomatic mission and I traveled the world. And I'm so glad for the forgiveness of Christ and his blood covering my sin. Because I'd be very embarrassed if people found out what I what I was doing when I was traveling alone. And one bout of dip diplomatic service took me to Sydney. I was doing some last minute shopping. I was laden with parcels and, and, and bags with toys and clothing for my children. I was walking down George Street. And this courteous, polite gentleman, he stepped out in front of me. And he offered me a pamphlet and he said, excuse me, sir, are you saved? If you die tonight, are you going to go to heaven? I thanked him very much for, but I was disturbed. I got back to my town in India and I sought out the Hindu priest and he couldn't help me, but he gave me some advice. He said only to satisfy your curiosity and nothing else. Go and talk to the missionary in the mission house at the end of the road. Well, that was fatal advice because the missionary led me to Christ. I quit Hinduism immediately and I then began to study for the, for the ministry. I left the diplomatic service and here I am by God's grace in charge of all these missionaries. And we are winning hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. Well, friends, eight months later... This Baptist pastor from Crystal Palace, he was ministering in Sydney in a place called Gaimia. Gaimia is one of the southern suburbs of Sydney. And one of the first questions he asked the local Baptist pastor in Sydney is, Hey friends, do you know a little man, an elderly man that witnesses and hands out gospel tracts on George Street? All over the world, I've been hearing about this man leading people to Jesus everywhere. Do you know who I'm talking about? And the Australian pastor said, well, yes, I do. His name is Mr. Jenner, J-E-N-N-E-R. And I don't think he does this anymore. He must be too old by now. The man said, do you, do you know him personally? He said, yes, I know where he lives. I want to meet him. Two nights later, they went around to this little apartment and they knocked on the door and there he was, this, this tiny, frail little man who opened the door and he sat them down and made them some tea. And, it, you know, he was quite old, you know, he was even uh, sopping the tea into his saucer as he was trying to drink it. And he sat there with them and this London preacher began to tell Mr. Jenner the accounts over the past three years. And the little man, he sat there with tears running down his cheeks. He said, let me tell you my side of the story. My story goes like this. I was serving on an Australian warship and I lived a reprobate life. And in a crisis, I really hit the wall. And one of my colleagues who I gave literal hell was there to help me. He led me to Jesus and the change in my life was night to day in 24 hours. And I was so grateful to God. I promised God that I would share Jesus in a simple witness with at least 10 people, at least 10 people a day as God gave me strength. Sometimes I was ill and I couldn't do it, but I made up for it at other times. I wasn't paranoid about it, but I've, I've done this for over 40 years. 
And in my retirement years, the best place to do it is definitely George Street. Because there are hundreds of people there. I had lots of rejections, but lots of people courteously took the tract. But he said, in 40 years of doing this, I have never heard of one single person coming to Jesus. In 40 years of giving out gospel tracts and trying to evangelize, I have never heard of one single person coming to Jesus. Now, that's got to be commitment, don't you think? That's got to be, you know, just sheer gratitude and love for Jesus to do this. Not hearing of any results. You know, someone did a little calculation that Mr. Jenner had reached over 146,100 people for Jesus. And that simple non-charismatic man was able to influence somehow to Jesus more people than we could ever have imagined or hoped for. And I really believe that God was showing this Baptist minister in London and in Australia just the tip of the tip of the tip of this iceberg. Because how many more people have been arrested for Christ, uh, you know, and in the mission field already? Because Mr. Jenner was faithful. He was sharing the gospel, not for results, not to win souls. He was sharing the gospel just to give it to people so they can make their own decision. You know, Mr. Jenner died two weeks later. Can you imagine the reward he went home to in heaven? Can you imagine the reward Mr. Jenner went home to in heaven? And I doubt it very much that his face would ever appear in, in Charisma magazine or Billy Graham's Decision magazine or all the lovely, you know, magazines that are all, or, or, or on some sort of, you know, um, big Christian website online. You're not going to see his picture there, you know, but it was, uh, you know, n nobody knew him apart from a small group of, of Baptists in southern Sydney. But I tell you this. Frank Jenner's name was famous in heaven. Heaven knew Mr. Jenner. And you can imagine the welcome that he went back to when he, went, when he was promoted to glory. Can you imagine the red carpet and the fanfare and the celebration when God's good and faithful servant came home? What I'm sharing, the reason why I'm sharing this testimony with you is because you've got to remember evangelism, it is the proclamation of the gospel. It is not winning souls. And we're told in Isaiah 55 verse 11, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. My friends, I want to remind you again and again and again, please try to remember if you if you can, that, that evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel. Nothing more, nothing else, and nothing less. Are you with me? And, and what an amazing, encouraging example to see a Christian sharing the gospel. He's not really receiving any results, you know, after year one, after 10 years, after 20 years, after 30 years. Only after 40 years did he have any feedback. And who knows, he may, yeah, he's lucky to have had that. I remember... I, I was preaching in Sydney by the Blue Mountains and I, I was preaching in, in a tent and somebody was sharing with me how they gave their life to Christ because they had encountered Frank Jenner. How many more people could have been won to Jesus through this man's faithful ministry? And so what about you? As you try to share the gospel using tracts, using your words, using social media. I don't know what is your method. Uh, maybe you like using the Evangel Cube. How many do you reach? Have you decided on a number? Frank Jenner decided he was going to reach at least 10 people a week. Well, it's not a competition. You might choose to reach one person a week or 100 people a week. It doesn't matter. But are you reaching anybody? And what's your motivation to do it? Surely our motivation is out of sheer gratitude. That's why evangelism, you shouldn't be doing it for results. It's nothing to do with results. God has got the results in his hands. It should be only be about 
our desire to be to be obedient to God. If we're a Christian, surely, surely we must feel the compassion to tell people. Don't you think? Are we not compassionate? Do we walk past people going to hell and we don't care? Are you that sort of person? I hope you're not. I hope you're not. Let me pray for you. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you very much indeed. And we thank you so much, Lord, for for the testimony of Frank Jenner and and so many other faithful servants in history that have, have been obedient to your word. They've been so grateful for the change that you've brought into their life that they are now going out and they're trying to tell people about you every day or every week or certainly every month. My Lord Jesus, I want to pray that, Lord, that we can be as passionate as these types of believers, not for glory, not for fame, but for the sake of obedience and compassion. My Lord, thank you so much that your last command to your believers was to go into the world and proclaim the gospel to all creation. I want to pray, Lord, that we would not reject this command. I want to pray that we, as believers today, right now, would make your last command our first top supreme priority in our life today tomorrow and every day until you call us home please help us to not forget some of the teaching points um, that we've looked at over the the weeks and months please today i pray lord that all of us will be guilty that we'll be guilty of evangelizing today i pray that all of us will be guilty of putting out the gospel on social media all of us may be found guilty dropping gospel tracts that we'll be, we'll be caught out speaking the gospel to people. Please help us, Lord, to build the habits. Please, I pray that we would, I guess it's been said before, but so often evangelism is not taught but caught. I want to pray that we would catch this, this desire, this, 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 this need to spread the good news. I pray that we would indeed have a gospel culture. And we say this prayer in your wonderful name, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.